Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you an update. Last week, uh, I told you my, um, my, my AC troubles, you know, my AC went out of my car. Um, I put it in the shop on Friday and then my AC went out in my home and that got uh, fixed on Friday. And so uh, last week was an $11,000 hickey. Um, so um, I'm taking up a collection. Um, I know I won't get much, but I'll take anything at this point. And it's, it's really kind of funny how God works. I told you, if you're ever going to teach, don't ever teach on sanctification because God will sanctify you. And he has a really kind of strange sense of humor. And um, I was laying in bed literally Saturday um, evening trying to go to sleep and really just irritated, you know, irritated about how much money I just spent on things I didn't want to spend it on. And the worst part was, uh, on Friday when I picked up my car that had gotten fixed, on my way home, it was blowing like warm air. And so I called up my mechanic and I said, hey, it's not working. He goes, well, it worked when you, when, when, this morning when you left. And I said, well, it, it ain't working now. So I had to take it back. Uh, so, you know, I was a little irritated. And, um, and God said, you know, there's some great lessons for you on sanctification and all of this. Literally, I heard him say that, you know, it's like, I don't, I don't want to hear it. I don't want, I don't want to know those lessons. And, but he, he said, think about this. You just spent $1,100 on a 13 year old car that has 186,000 miles on it. Hey, Ken, it's still a 13 year old car with 186,000 miles on it. And I'm like, Lord, I know that. I know that. And something else is going to break. And he goes, that's the point. You fixing that car is like you trying to sanctify yourself. It doesn't do any good. You can't sanctify yourself. You have a car that now blows colder air, but it's still a 13-year-old car with 186,000 miles on it. And think about your house. You just put in a new AC unit that blows cold air, and that's wonderful, and it's got a higher rating, and it's going to get better you know, energy savings and all that, but it's still a 28-year-old home, and something else is going to break. Literally, I'm hearing God say this to me. And he says, that's what sanctification in the flesh looks like. When you try to fix something only God can fix. Because what dawned on me is that neither my house nor my car are new. I don't have a new car. I don't have a new house. I still have an old car and an old house and other things are going to break. And I can't fix that. I can only put a bandaid on it. And so really this does have a lot to do with what we're talking about, that sanctification is the work of God. It's not the work of men. You can't do it. I can't do it. And yet we spend way too much of our life trying to do it ourselves. So I'm going to read you once again just a portion of Colossians chapter 3, which we talked about last week, which was part of your homework from that week. And and this is one of those passages we turn to when we think about, man, I got to get more holy. I got to get more righteous. I got to do something about my walk with the Lord. Verse 5 says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And then he gives us this wonderful list, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Twice he said that. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Don't lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self. There it is again, a third time. With its practices. And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Now, What's important in that little section of verses is that what we do is we take that verse, those verses, we take that book in particular and others like it, and we say, okay, what do I need to be more godly? And here's the formula we use. Less bad stuff plus more good stuff equals godliness. Now, that makes all the sense in the world from a human perspective. It just doesn't make any biblical sense because it's not biblical. Less bad behavior plus more good behavior does not equal godliness. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about this morning. You and I know unsaved people who don't know Jesus Christ from a hole in the wall who do a lot of really good stuff. 
who don't do a lot of bad stuff, and they do less bad stuff than maybe we do and more good stuff than we do, but that does not make them godly. And the same thing is true of you and I. Just because you do good things and you don't do some bad things does not make you godly. But that's how we approach sanctification. Sanctification, from our viewpoint, is about what do I need to do to become more godly, more Christ-like, more spiritual, more mature, whatever it is. What do I need to do and what do I need to stop doing? And one of the books I read in preparation for this this last summer is... uh, Title Sanctification, and it's by a guy named Kelly M. Capick, and he says this, the putting off of the old uniform in verses 5 through 9, which we just read, is balanced by the putting on of verses 12 through 17. Holiness does not consist of stopping bad behavior and eschewing sinful attitudes alone, but of replacing them with good behavior and pursuing Christ-like attitudes. Years ago, Michael Griffiths warned that there is a kind of Christian negative holiness which rejoices in discarding various forms of worldliness, but which leaves the individual stark naked. Now, what he's suggesting, and I don't disagree with him, but I think it's a little bit incomplete. He's suggesting that you look at Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through really 17, and you here's a list of stuff to put off, here's a list of stuff to put on, and if you do those things, you will be more godly. Really what Paul is talking about in those verses when he says, put off the old self, it's not necessarily the list of bad behaviors that he's referencing. He's saying, put off the old identity, which is characterized by those behaviors. It's about identity. Put off the old identity. You're not that person anymore. And he says, put on the new self, which is like Christ. That's your new identity and everything that goes with that. What does Christ do? How does Christ behave? What, what was his characteristics as he walked in the, on this earth? So you're putting off an old identity that's not yours anymore. Remember, we're not of Adam. We're of the man of heaven, Jesus Christ, and put on your new identity. That's what sanctification is. What we do is we look at the behaviors and we go, okay, well, I got to stop doing this and I got to start doing this. And if you do that, you might be successful for a while, but eventually you'll fail and you'll fall back into your old behaviors. So this morning, what I want to talk to you about is this this idea of um, doing good things, hoping that it will make you a good person, a godly person. Are we to do good things? Yes, no doubt about it. Bible's really clear that we are to do certain things and not do other things. But it is not that process that makes you godly. And that's important for us to understand as we talk about sanctification. So last week we talked about that it's not all about us. Sanctification is not about you, it's about God. And it's about his glory, not your glory. It's not about you getting cred for how spiritual you are and people patting you on the back and going, man, you're such a godly person. Because here's, here's the reality of that scenario. Um, if you spent time with me, you might at the end of the day conclude, well, yeah, man, he's a godly guy. He, he, he handles himself well, he prays well, he, you know, whatever. Whatever your criteria for godliness, you may assume I'm godly. If you would have spent time with me last week, you would have assumed I don't even know Jesus Christ. Uh, just by my behavior, my attitudes, my actions, I was not a happy camper last week. I was not very sanctified in my behavior. And, you know, depending on the day you meet me and what I'm going through, I may or may not appear to you holy, sanctified, or godly in any way. See, behavior can't be the criteria alone. Is behavior important? Yes, but it's a byproduct of something else. Sanctification is not just about behavior. It's about status. It's about identity. It's about who you are in Christ, and it's not about you. And I'm going to beat that horse until it literally falls down because it's so important for us to understand that because we live in a me society. It's always about me. Everything's about me, but not sanctification. Here's what Jesus says. In the same way, let your light shine. So he's speaking to his disciples. By inference, he's speaking to you and I. Let your light shine before others. So there's something we're supposed to do. So that they, others, may what? May see your good works. So are we to produce good works? Yes. And we're to let our light shine. But what's the ultimate byproduct of that? God gets the glory. So that they give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Not you get the glory, 
Not you get the pat on the back and the accolades and, man, you're an amazing guy. You're so godly. You're so whatever. It's, no, I let my light shine so that they may see my good works, but God gets the glory. Why does God get the glory? Because he produces the good works, not me. See, when God produced the world, the universe, the earth, the vegetation, the animals, Adam and Eve, he got all the glory because he did all the work. All Adam and Eve were told to do is just, take, just steward it, just take care of it. You don't get glory for taking care of something. You get glory for creating something. And so even in this scenario, we don't get the glory God does. He also said this in John chapter 15, by this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. So are we to bear fruit? Yes. What kind of fruit? The fruit of the Spirit. Which inherently means that it's not my fruit, it's his fruit. It comes from God, it flows through me, it's that light flowing out of me, but I am to bear fruit. And when we do, we prove to be his disciples. So yes, there's behavior involved, there are good things that we are to do, but they are produced by God for the good of others and for his glory, not mine. Sanctification cannot be and should not be and never, never was intended to be about you. It's intended to be about him for the good of others, those around you, not for your good. So let your light shine, he says. I love how Paul picks this up in his second letter to the Corinthians. He says, for God, who said, let there be light in the darkness, a reference to the creation, when God spoke and there was light, has made this light, this light shining in us, this light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, He's made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ, so that we could understand the power, the glory of God as it manifests itself in us and out of us in the form of our behavior, in the form of light. He goes on and says, we have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. Paul basically is calling you a cracked pot. And you are. I have one in my office. I have a cracked clay pot. And I have it in there because of this, to remind me that that's me. And what's really cool about God is that he puts the light of his glory in me, a cracked pot, and his light shines through my cracks. And when, when others look at me and go, man, how in the world can you, you have patience like that? How in the world can you have joy in the midst of sorrow? How can you, they are seeing the light of God shine through my cracks. What they don't know is how much doubt I have, how much fear I have, how much self-loathing I have at times, how much I beat myself up. And yet what they see is the light of the glory of God coming through the cracks of my fragile clay pot life. And they are what? Attracted to God. That's what this is all about. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. I love the way he puts that. Our great power. When people see it, they, they go, man, how did you do that? How do you, how do you live like that? How are you so, again, happy in the midst of difficult times? How do you handle that? And they see power, but what we realize is it's not my power, it's his power. You know, Paul said, I rejoice in, I glory in my weakness so that the power of God may be seen in me. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. Why? Because of him. So again, sanctification is not about you. It's not about me. It's about him. It's not for ourselves. It doesn't flow from ourselves. We're just containers. Now, part of me hates that, right? I don't want to be a container. That sounds kind of lame. But in the grand scheme of God's redemptive story. I am merely a container holding his glory that flows out of me to benefit those all around me. I reveal his light and he gets all the glory. You know, when, when Paul talks about in Romans chapter two, that no one was, no one has an excuse because God has revealed himself, his glory, his majesty, his power, his existence in all of creation. See, anytime God makes anything, it's to reveal his glory. But as we saw several weeks ago when Adam and Eve fell, guess what? They lost that ability to reveal his glory because they became sin-burdened and sin-saturated. And while made in the image of God, they no longer bore the image of God. They no longer reflected the image of God. But you and I can. Because he has placed his glory in me and in you if you're in Christ. And guess what? And it's in spite of you, not because of you. 
It's not because he looked down and went, man, Ken's a pretty sharp guy. That's a pretty cool container. No, he looked down, saw a cracked clay pot and put his glory in me and his light shines through me. And if anybody sees power in my life, it only comes from him, not me. And I can't take credit for it. I can't glory in it. All the glory goes to him. It's never from me. Paul again tells the Corinthian believers, for our sake, he made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, that's an important phrase. We might become the righteousness of God. Notice it doesn't say say that we might become righteousness because that puts the glory on us. We become the righteousness of God. We are his means by which he reveals his righteousness to the world. But what we do is we turn the spotlight on us and go, look how righteous I am. Look how righteous I've become. Look what I've done to become more righteous. It's not about my righteousness or your righteousness. It's about his righteousness. The very fact that he could have wiped me out, done me in, taken me out at any point along the way because of my sin. But he was gracious, kind, and patient. And he showed mercy and he provided a means that I might be redeemed. And it reveals his righteousness. Everything he does is right and good and just and holy. It's not about my righteousness. It's about him. It's always about his righteousness. Sanctification is about God's righteousness, not yours. Are you to live righteously? Yes. Why? Because you belong to him. He has set you apart. That's what sanctification means. You are his creation. You are a new creature. You belong to him. You're his property. And you are to live according to who you are, your new identity. Put off the old self. That's not who you are. Put on the new self. Created to be in the image of your creator. That's, again, what sanctification is really all about. And it always involves the light of his glory, not yours. One of the things that, that this is the fifth, fourth time I've taught this this week, and one of the things that guys have come up to me and wrestled with this and, you know, well, what, what's my role? What do I do? How do I make this work? And, you know, how do I not make it about me? And, and this is really hard for us because not only do we want to get credit, but there's not necessarily anything wrong with someone coming up to you and saying, you know, man, you, you, you just seem like a, a godly guy. You seem to really love the Lord and you seem to have the spirit of God in you. There's nothing wrong with that. It's what you do with that. If you glory in that, if you take all the credit and go, well, yeah, I work really hard on it, and I'm, you know, I, I spend 30 minutes a day in my Bible, and that's the reason I'm a godly man, then I would encourage you to kind of step away from that. Um, that's a dangerous place to go, because at the end of the day, you didn't, you didn't really do anything to make you godly. God did. So this, this is, it can be a little bit confusing as to what our role is, and we're going to dig into that as we move further along in this study. But really, the, the, the idea of sanctification is the gospel being lived out in your life every day. What do I mean by that? For a lot of us in the room, the gospel is, when did you come to know Christ? When did you become a believer? For me, it was seven years old. I walked down the aisle of my dad's church, and I gave my, my life to Christ. Because that's what I was told. That's the gospel. That's the good news. You're a sinner. He died for your sins, you give your life to him, and he redeems you, and he forgives you, and you get to spend eternity with him. That's the gospel. Paul would have a, not a difference of opinion, but he would expand the definition and include not only your salvation, for me, seven years old, but my sanctification, where I am right now, and my ultimate glorification. That's the gospel. The good news is the whole thing. Because guess what? It's not good news if I got saved, but I don't get glorified. It's not good news if I get saved, but I get left here and I don't get glorified. I get to be sanctified, but I don't get to go spend eternity with him. That's not good news. That's bad news. That's incomplete news. That's impartial news. So the good news is the whole thing. And so the gospel or sanctification is the gospel, the good news of my salvation, my sanctification, and my ultimate glorification lived out in everyday life. How's that true? Well, as I live on this earth... I know I'm saved. I know it happened. I know Christ lives in me and I have the spirit of God living in me. I know I've grown in my salvation and it's the work of God. It's, it's what he's done in me through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
But I also know I still have a sin nature. I know I still fail and I fall and I get angry when my AC breaks down and I have to spend money I don't want to spend. I, I know that reality, but I'm living in the hope of a future reality, my glorification. You know, the other thing I shared with the guy the other day, you know, I, I had a cataract surgery a couple of weeks ago. I now see 2020 at all distances. Um, I'm still 64 years old, and there's a whole lot wrong with this thing. I see clearly, but this thing's still falling apart. I'm partially fixed, but I'm not completely fixed. The guy who fixed my eyes did not fix the rest of me. I wish he'd have kept going, but he wasn't qualified to do that. You know, I, I didn't get Botox, I didn't get lipo, I didn't get, you know, I need all of that, but I didn't, can't afford it. Um, but I only fixed a portion. I put a Band-Aid on my eyes, but I didn't fix the rest of this thing. Well, what do I know? One day I'm getting a new body. One day all of this is gonna get fixed. And there ain't a doctor on earth that can fix it the way God's going to fix it. So this idea that it's the gospel being lived out in our daily lives is what we have to continually remind ourselves that God's not done yet. I've been saved. I'm being sanctified. But one day I'm going to be glorified. See, Jesus died not only to redeem you, but to totally remake you. And that's something that we don't think about a lot as Christians, and especially when we think about sanctification. But listen to what Paul says. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and if you are in Christ, you've been saved, you've placed your faith in Christ, you're a new creation. Now just look around the room. Don't, don't give anybody eye contact, but look around the room. I don't see anybody out there that looks like a new creation to me. Some of you look better than others. Some of you look worse than me. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm sad, but... Um, <laughs> You're, you don't look like a new creation, but God tells you through Paul that you're a new creation. He goes on, the old has passed away. Really? It raised its ugly head on me last week. No, Ken, it's, it's gone. That's an anomaly. That's not the norm for you. Behold, the new has come, and all of it is from God, which goes back to who gets the glory? God. Who did the work? God. Who made you new? God, not you. Who through Christ reconciled us to himself? See, you're a new creation. You're not a 28-year-old home with a new AC unit in it. You're not a 13-year-old car with 186,000 miles with a new compressor in it. You're not a 64-year-old man with new lenses in your eyes, but the rest of your body's falling apart. You're a new creation. You have been made new. And Paul goes on and tells the Romans, we died. When? When Christ died. We died with him. We were buried with him. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. He's very specific in his wording. We may live new lives. We have permission to, the power to. We can also choose not to. But guys, we have everything, according to Peter, we have everything we need to live godly lives for life and godliness. It's all been given to us, made possible by him. And at the end of the day, that's the bottom line. You have everything you need and you can live and should live and should want to live a new life. You should want to live out Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 17. I'm going to put off the old me because that ain't me anymore. I'm going to put on the new me because it's been paid for, bought for, provided by God for me. Why wouldn't I? Why wouldn't I live in who I am, my new identity? And I'm not going to obsess about the behavior as much as I'm, I'm going to obsess about the power that makes the behavior possible. And when I do that, I get glory. If I, if I obsess with the behavior and I go, today I'm going to be patient. Dadgummit, I'm going to be patient. For the first time in my life, I'm going to be patient. All stinking day long, I'm going to be patient. And when I was younger, I would make those kind of statements, and then my kids would wake up. Dadgummit, the kids woke up. <laughs> what happened to your patience? My kids woke up. Or I'd go get in my car, and I'd start driving to work, and I'd get cut off in traffic, and I'm cussing out the guy next to me in the car because he cut me off, and that's my lane. Get out of my way. I'm on my way to work. And I lost my patience. Because I'm trying to make myself godly based on trying to mimic some behavior that I think will make me godly, and I can't make myself godly. You can't make yourself godly. You can live a new life, but you can only live that life based on the capacity given to you by God through Jesus Christ. Otherwise, why did he put his spirit in you? 
Why did he give you the Holy Spirit if you could pull this off on your own? You can't. That's, that's why Jesus was very particular with his disciples. He goes, if I don't go, he can't come. Who's he? The helper, the Holy Spirit. But if, it's better for me if I leave than if I stay, because if I leave, he comes, and you're going to have all the power you need to do what you've been called to do. Not only just go and witness, and not just you know, heal and do all the wonderful things the disciples did, but to live godly lives as men, just like you and me. See, one of the things I want to get home to you today is that you're not a slightly improved version of the old you. That's what my car is right now. It's a slightly better car than it was last week when the compressor went out. My house is slightly better because it cools better than it did a week ago. I can see better than I could three weeks ago. But that's just a slightly improved version of the old me. That is not what Jesus Christ did for you. He completely changed you. Sanctification is not the good you getting better, but that's the bill of goods that we have bought, far too many of us, that I, I, I'm just a little bit better and I gotta keep getting a little bit better. There is no good you, right? There's no good you. Remember what Paul said in chapter seven of Romans? He says, I know nothing good dwells in me. If the apostle Paul could say that, can't we admit it? Nothing good dwells in me, guys. In my flesh, he goes on to qualify and clarify. Nothing good dwells in this body. This body will never accomplish anything good. This body will never do anything godly. It will do good things. It can do good things. And again, there are lost people who do a lot of good things, but they don't do godly things. All their righteous deeds are as filthy rags in the eyes of God. So are mine if done in the flesh. No good dwells in me. So I'm not good and I'm not getting better. And I hate that. I hate to think about that. But if I don't think about that, I start to get cocky. Man, I was patient today. I didn't blow up at my wife. I didn't yell at my grandkids or my kids. I didn't do this or I didn't do that. Or I did do this or I did do that. And I get cocky and I start thinking, I'm, I'm pretty good at this sanctification thing. It's a lot easier than I thought. And then the next train wreck happens in my life and I fall apart and I get angry and I go back to the old habits and I take on the old identity again and I realize I can't do this by myself. See, we're told that we were dead and I've been given new life. I'm a new creation. I'm not a slightly improved version. I was dead and I've been brought back to life. When the guy put the new lenses in my eyes, he didn't kill me and give me new eyes. He just put me half asleep opened up my eye and stuck some new lenses in. Slightly different picture, right? When Jesus healed the blind people, that's not what he did. He gave them new ability to see. He healed blind eyes. He recreated their eyesight. He didn't stick in new lenses made by Alcon. He did a miracle. That's what sanctification is all about. It's a miracle. Because you were cursed, you were condemned, now you're blessed, and now you're forgiven. You have been radically changed. You were not the same old you. Paul tells the Colossians, you were dead. That was your status before coming to Christ. You were dead because of your sins, because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God, and this is huge, made you alive. See, I, I look back, and when I was seven, I have a hard time remembering that far back, but I, I, I don't remember being dead. I remember having fun and playing and doing all kinds of stuff, but spiritually, I was dead. I was blind. I was lifeless. I could do nothing. There was no good in me, and there could no good come out of me. I was dead, but I was made alive with Christ, and he forgave all my sin, byproduct. The miracle is I was made alive. The byproduct, the blessing is all my sins are forgiven. He canceled the record of the charges against me and took it away by nailing it to the cross. See, I was dead, but now I'm alive. And I went back and looked at all the different passages that have to do with the change that took place in me and in you if you're in Christ. You were dead, now you're alive. You were a sinner, now you're a saint. You were condemned, now you're forgiven. You used to be an alien from God, now you're a citizen of his kingdom. You used to be a debtor, you owed him everything. You owed him your life, because that's the penalty for sin. Now you're an heir of the kingdom. Everything that is Christ is yours. You used to be his enemy, now you're his friend. Here's the reality for every guy in this room. You spend way too much time on the left-hand side of this equation. 
Seeing yourself as still dead, seeing yourself as still a sinner and not a saint, still living condemned that, gosh, I'm, not, I'm just not all I should be and God's unhappy with me and I got to do more to make God love me and I've fallen out of love with God or he's fallen out of love with me and I'm still, I still owe so much to God. And we live on the left-hand side when God says, no, you are on the right-hand side. That's your identity. It's the new you. Not a slightly improved version of the old you, but a totally new you. A.W. Pink is one of the guys that I read, and his book is also called Sanctification. I'm going to quote from him a little bit right now, and I want you to just think about what this guy says. He's long gone, and he writes from a different era, so he writes a little more verbose, but he says, there's such a thing as the goodliness of the flesh. I don't think goodliness is a word in the dictionary. I think he made it up, but I love it. He says, there's, there's such a thing as the goodliness of the flesh, which is as the flower of the field. And he quotes from Isaiah. And Isaiah talks about the flower of the field, which springs up and it looks beautiful. And the next day it dries up and it dies and it blows away. Yet as the very next verse tells us, the spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it and it's gone. That's what goodliness is. It's fleeting. It's temporary. It's got no lasting value. He says, but so easily are the simple deceived today that they often mistake such goodliness for godliness. When you do good things, when you got a list of stuff, if I do these things, I'll be godly. And if I don't do these things, I'll be godly. And you do them and you mistake it for godliness. And it's just goodliness. It's you doing a list of stuff that you think will make you godly. And A.W. Pink says, it's nothing more than goodliness. See, it's the goodliness of the flesh. And he goes on and says, the fact of the matter is that very much of what that passes for sanctification is nothing more than a species of Pharisaism. What's Pharisaism? Well, who are the Pharisees? They were the religious leaders of Jesus' day who were known for what? Their good deeds, their righteousness. They were the keepers of the law. They were the makers of the law. They were the, the peak of the mountain when it came to righteousness and spirituality and the people all looked up to him. But what did Jesus call them? Hypocrites, whitewashed tombs. You're beautiful on the outside, but you're full of dead, man, dead man's bones on the inside. They had all the outer trappings of goodliness, but they were not godly. And the sad thing is there's a lot of people going to churches today who are goodly people who do goodly things, but they are not godly people. And I'm not saying they're not in Christ. I'm just saying that they're living according to the flesh, not according to the power of the spirit. And who gets the glory when they live that way? They do, not God. He goes on and says, in true, a true and God-honoring Christian testimony, my reader, does not consist of magnifying self by telling of your attainments and excellencies, which with apparent humility, now I love how he puts this, are ascribed to divine enabling. In other words, it's like, well, I know I'm a, I know I'm a godly guy. And God helped. You know, God did his part, but I'm the one that spent an hour in the word. I'm the one that prayed this morning and God answered my prayer. God did this, but I'm the one that made it happen. You know, it's this kind of veiled humility, but it's really all about me, not about God. God just becomes the enabler. It's not about self. It's not about magnifying self. He has no, very far from it. That witness, which is most honoring to the Lord, is one which acknowledges his amazing grace. And we talked about this last week. It's all about grace. And which magnifies his infinite patience and continue to bear with such un, an ungrateful, hard-hearted, and unresponsive wretch. Now you may go, whoa, that's harsh. That was me last week. Ungrateful, hard-hearted, and unresponsive in the midst of teaching on sanctification five times last week. I'm not proud of that, but that's the reality, that in his grace, in his mercy, he revealed in me ungratefulness, shaking my fist at God. Why are you doing this to me? I can't afford this. I don't need this. Why does this have to happen to me? Why can't it happen to somebody else like Ted Kitchens? Why me? I was hard-hearted. I, I felt a distance from God, even in the midst of talking on sanctification. And I became unresponsive. I became unresponsive to my wife. I became unresponsive to God. I, I just, I started getting this kind of hard heart. And yet he showed me grace upon grace upon grace and patience upon patience upon patience. And he, he taught me and walked me through it. And I came out of it 
Not completely, but I came out of it more godly than I entered into it. See, that's the grace of God. That's sanctification. That's the gospel being lived out in my life in reality, in, in real life. See, what, what amazes me is that God doesn't look down from heaven and go, man, Ken, you were really good today. I'm amazed at what you did today. I'm amazed that you didn't cuss like a sailor when you were up in the attic for two hours trying to fix that leak in your air conditioner. I'm amazed that you handled it the way you handled it. See, God never looks down. He's never amazed, and he never, he never wakes up in the morning, not that God wakes up in the morning, waiting to see what I'm going to do that day all the great things I'm going to do for him. I can't wait to see how you bring me glory. He does look down and go, man, I am going to reveal my glory through you, you crazy crackpot. And here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to let your AC go out. I'm going to let your car AC go out. I'm going to let this happen. This is going to take place in your life today. But you know what? If you let me, I will reveal my glory in you and through you to all those around you. And I'll get glory and you'll grow to love me more. See, he's not glorified by my goodliness. He's glorified by godliness. And where does godliness come from? Him, not me. He's never impressed with my efforts at holiness. When I, when I wake up in the morning and say, today I'm going to be in the word. Today I'm going to pray harder. Today I'm going to do this. Today I'm going to do that. That is about you trying to live a goodly life when he wants to produce a godly life. And we're going to get into this more and more as we dig into this, but it's, it's all about dependence. It's all about reliance. It's all about the reality that I need him to do what only he can do in me, which is exactly what A.W. Pink goes on to say. The great mistake made by most of the Lord's people is in hoping to discover in themselves that which is to be found in Christ alone. What can I do to be more godly? Think about the silliness of that statement. What can I do to look more like Christ? When Christ has already done everything you need done to make you like Christ. He died. He rose again. He sent his spirit. He's the one who empowers you. He's the one who makes it all possible. It's not what do I need to do. It's what do I need to let God do that only God can do. Which means dependence, reliance, and waiting on him to accomplish everything that needs to be accomplished. So I want to take a, just a kind of a slight detour, and I want to take what we've just talked about, your attempts at goodliness rather than godliness, and I want to talk about that you were here to make a difference real quickly, because Jesus made a difference. Everywhere Jesus went, he made a difference, and no one in this room can argue that. Everywhere he went, everyone he talked to, he impacted by the way he, said, he talked, the things he did, the miracles, the teaching. Look at this. People were amazed at his teaching. Well, Yeah. But it wasn't just the content of his teaching. It was the fact that it was coming out of that guy. Remember, he was a Jew. He looked like a Jew. He acted like a Jew. They saw him as a Jew. They thought he was from Nazareth. They thought he was the son of Mary and Joseph, maybe illegitimate. They weren't really sure about that. They didn't know a whole lot about him. Maybe he's a rabbi. Maybe he's this. Maybe he's that. But they were amazed at what came out of his mouth. How about this one? The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where'd this guy get all this wisdom? Where did, where did he get the power to do these miracles? They were amazed. But then just a little bit later, it goes, then they scoffed. What the heck happened? Oh, they found out where he's from. Well, he's just a carpenter. He's the son of Mary and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and his sisters live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. It was interesting this morning, one of the guys came up and he goes, hey, uh, I need, to, I need to find out if this is true, but somebody told, you you've ne told me that you've never been to seminary. I said, it's true, I've never been to seminary. And he goes, wow. Well, where did you, where did you learn? I said, I don't know, I guess, just, I guess reading the Bible. You know, just studying. And, 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 and he was amazed at that. And he shouldn't be amazed at that, because guess what? It's the same thing available to you, and it was available to me, and... I'm not dissing seminary. I'm, I'm a big fan of seminary, but not everybody needs to go to seminary. And I think half the people in seminary don't need to be in seminary. They need to go get a job and they need to go work and not hang around waiting to find that perfect job working for some church. But see, they were amazed because they saw him as a carpenter. They scoffed because he was a car carpenter. They... Everywhere he went, everything he said, everything he did got a reaction. 
He goes up to the temple and he teaches, and they're surprised. How does he know so much when he's never been trained? Now that you know, if you didn't know before that I've never been to seminary, you may not come back. Well, how do I know he knows what he's talking about? He didn't go to seminary. I have a brother who went to seminary. He didn't believe in Jesus. So do something with that. Um, I'm not blaming the seminary, but going to seminary doesn't, didn't fix that problem. See, they were completely amazed, and they said it again and again. Everything he does is wonderful. He even makes the deaf to hear and give speech to those who can't speak. He's amazing. He's wonderful. He always got a response, and look at these responses. Surprise, astonishment, gratitude, anger, jealousy, resentment, confusion, belief. And the last one was the, le the least of the ones that he got. But he always got a reaction. He always got a response. Everything he did. But he cared more about the response of his father than the response of the people. See, when you live the Christian life in the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of God, you will not care as much about what people think. You will not care as much. You will care far more about what your father thinks, which is why he says, I can do nothing on my own. I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. That will become increasingly more your attitude. And that's how you can know when you're beginning to live according to his power, not your own. When you're living a godly life, not a goodly life. When you see yourself not needing a pat on the back every time you speak or every time you say something or do something and I need somebody to act, give me accolades and a, that a boy and you don't need it. He says, I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the father taught me. I don't do this for me. I don't do it in my power, my will. I do it according to his. And I love what Peter says about Jesus. He didn't retaliate when he was insulted. He didn't threaten revenge when he suffered. Even on the cross, he didn't do those things. He could have called down myriad upon myriad of angels. He could have wiped out every Roman and every Pharisee and every Sadducee, and, but he didn't. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. See, you'll know you're growing in godliness when you can begin to see these things manifest themselves in your life. And this is something I wrote this summer about sanctification. Jesus bore the image of God wherever he went and all that he did. People couldn't help but notice that this man was different. They didn't always like what they saw or heard, but they couldn't ignore the fact that Jesus was different. By living his life according to the will of God and in the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus made an impact on the lives of all with whom he came into contact. Do you. Do you. I guarantee you get a reaction from everybody. But do you get a a reaction for the right reason? Do you get a reaction and does that reaction point people to God or does it point people to you? So here's your questions this morning. I want you to share some ways in which you have been able to impact or influence the lives of others by living your life according to God's will. And be specific, you know, and it doesn't have to be a positive impact. You could have gone to work and shared your testimony with somebody and they basically said, shut up, I don't wanna hear this anymore and they walked away, that's okay. That's a reaction. Jesus got that. Maybe you did share your testimony and somebody came to faith in Christ because you were willing to step out and risk that. But share some ways in which you've in impacted or influenced those around you, your family, your kids, your wife, your coworkers. I want you to discuss the difference between godliness and what A.W. Pink refers to as goodliness. How can you spot the difference between the two in your own life? And this is a real subtle deal here. I've sat around some of the tables in the last few weeks and, or last few days that they've talked about these things. It's very subtle. Sometimes we don't see it. But what's the difference between goodliness, good things done in the flesh, and godliness, what only God can do? Finally, have somebody read 1 Timothy 4, 12 through 13. How could we apply Paul's words to Timothy to our lives today? Father, thank you for these men. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the fact that you have made all things possible for us to live a godly life life, not just a goodly life. Thank you, Father, that we are new creations. We are new creatures. We are made new. We have been made alive. You've, been, you've done what only you can do and made that truth, that reality, that new identity be fleshed out in our lives, literally fleshed out as we live and walk and breathe and talk and do all the things we do. May your power be revealed in us and through us. Fragile clay pots revealing the glory of God to all those around us. And I pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.